uh, once you have this part down uh, for the PDE, we want to move on to the quantitative theory. There are two basic questions uh, in a uh, quantitative theory of homogenization. Uh, one deal with the convergence rates. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I will present two very simple cases uh, uh, which uh, leads to uh, convergence rate uh, in H1 and also in L2. Uh, uh, on the third and the fourth uh, lecture, we'll, uh, we will discuss uh, the, uh, the problem of uh, uh, uniform regularity uh, for homogenization. Uh, that will be done on Thursday and Friday here. So first of all, let me uh, review what we have uh, proved mainly last time. Uh, again, this is the setup. We're dealing with a family of elliptic operators, second order, in divergence form, uh, with, a prime, with a small parameter appeared in the denominators of the variable. Uh, epsilon here is uh, presumed to be very small, say somewhere between zero and one. And there are basic assumptions I want to make. Uh, first of all, we, we're going to deal with uh, real uh, bounded measurable and uh, uh, uniformly elliptic uh, operators. So A is real, bounded, measurable, and uniformly ellip elliptic. Uh, for the most part, uh, we do not need any uh, regularity today. Uh, so bounded measurable will be suffice. And also, we'll uh, assuming that uh, A is one periodic. Uh, that is, uh, the, the matrix is periodic with respect to the uh, integer lattice, okay? So, uh, so here are the precise uh, assumption. Uh, ellipticity, uh, meaning that uh, the matrix is positive definite with uh, positive lambda mu, and also bounded above by mu to the ne negative one. Uh, periodicity uh, with respect to integer lattice, that is if you change, you put a z here with integer coordinates, then you have the same uh, matrix. And um, I, f I probably forgot to mention that all the results we will talk about in this lecture holds for elliptic systems. So although you do not see upper indices, uh, that's just for simplicity, you can see that all the techniques uh, has uh, nothing to do with the scalar case. Okay? The same proof carries over uh, directly to the systems of uh, ellipt uh, elliptic systems. Okay. So uh, here is what we prove uh, in the first lecture, uh, just uh, looking at uh, the Dirichlet problem. Uh, uh, so you, you have, uh, a, again, A is elliptic, a periodic, omega is bounded, Lipschitz. And let's say you have a weak solution to a, a Dirichlet uh, problem uh, with right-hand side F in H minus one and the boundary data in H one half. And then you, by lax milgram you have a weak solution in H1, unique. And the theorem, the theorem uh, states that uh, uh, as epsilon goes to zero, the solution converge weakly in H1, and therefore strongly in L2. And also the flux of the solution, which is just the matrix multiplied to the gradient, converged to uh, A hat. Uh, that is the effective matrix we introduced yesterday, uh, times the gradient of, of, of the limit, U0. And this is a weakly weak convergence in, in L2 here. And, and furthermore, this limit function is a weak solution to, uh, to the boundary, to the Dirichlet problem with the same data, but for the operator L0. And that is the uh, effective operator with coefficient A hat here. So we prove this uh, uh, in lecture one using, uh, using Dirichlet lemma. I hope I got uh, the, the main idea crossed there. 
otherwise you can read the, uh, the proof in detail in the lecture notes. Okay, so uh, today we're gonna look at this, the problem of a convergence rate. So we know it converges, uh, uh, the solution converges in, in L2 strongly. So it makes sense to ask, what is the convergence rate you have for, for the difference uh, u epsilon minus u0 me measured in L2 norm, okay? Also, uh, in general, uh, unless the character is zero, uh, the solution does not converge strongly in, in H1. Um, however, we can ask, suppose we allow to uh, subtract another term, which we're gonna call first order corrector. You're gonna see some form there. Uh, later uh, for this function v epsilon, then we can talk about convergence, strong convergence in H1. So what can you say about convergence in H1 uh, with a first order corrector? So these are the, uh, the question we wanna uh, address today. In a very simple setting, and uh, there are more elaborate uh, argument in the lecture notes. But I'm, to get the idea across, I'm only going to look at a very simple case. Uh, okay. The, so here's the theorem, uh, one of the theorems. Uh, again, the matrix is elliptic, periodic. Uh, I need some smoothness assumption on the domain omega. Uh, let's say C11, this condition probably can be weakened. Uh, then the L2 norm of U epsilon minus U0 is bounded by a constant which only depend on a dimension, D, the ellipticity, ellipticity constant mu and the domain omega uh, times epsilon times the, the H two norm, uh, uh, H2 norm of U0. So this, this will be uh, uh, one of the theorems we, we will uh, prove uh, today, uh, which actually gave you, this is the sharp convergence uh, uh, with a power one here, first order convergence uh, in L2, in L2 space, okay? So that's, we'll, we'll come back to this, this theorem uh, later on here. Uh, actually, the, the f uh, so uh, the next I want to present the, 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 the theorem in H1. Uh, actually, we're gonna prove first the, the convergence rate in H1 and come back to L2, uh, okay? So, uh, so we'll ask, so if we're gonna subtract something, what should we subtract? So we come back to the two-scale expansion. I uh, briefly mentioned in the very beginning of the first lecture. That is, if you're gonna do a formal two-scale asymptotic expansion, try to find, figure out the right formula for the, uh, for the effective coefficient or for the corrector, what will be? So, we, so it turns out we end up with uh, U0 in the first term, which only depend on X, does not depend on epsilon. The second term is, is of this form, so you have so you have, uh, so you have epsilon, uh, which is u zero of x plus uh, epsilon times chi k times the derivative of the first term in x k, and there are more high order terms. And this this uh, this chi k, the so called corrector, is is a solution to this equation, so we're gonna uh, uh, scale back to one. I have A, I, J, uh, let, let me say, I use K here if I want to, uh, no. So, uh, uh, J actually. So D, chi, K, D, Y, J is D, D, Y, I, A, I, K. Okay, again, the summation convention is used, all the repeated indices are summed, i, i, j, j, and k is fixed. So k here is between one and the dimension d here. So that is, the, so this is the equation, and we also, of course, want uh, x, k, uh, chi, k to be one periodic. Uh, okay, for otherwise, you just simply can just take a linear function that give you a solution, but that's not a solution we want. 
here. Okay, so that is the uh, the formula for the for the correctors, and uh, and I mentioned I suppose uh, you have a matrix. The column is divergence free. Then the right hand side will be zero. In that case, your corrector is zero identically. Uh, uh, but that's uh, that. That will be. But in general, you do have a corrector here, a one periodic function, and that is the function appear here. So this somehow suggests that if you want to subtract a, uh, some corrector, you should put this form. So this actually is what we're going to do. We're going to introduce uh, u epsilon minus u zero uh, epsilon times the corrector, and then there's some other stuff. So I want to explain why we want to do this here. Uh, one of the reasons we ne need to somehow smoothen out uh, this uh, uh, this term is because the corrector in general may not be bounded. And so we know it's it's a solution here, and uh, so chi k is a h1 function on the torus, and. Uh, in a single equation case, in a scalar case, it follows from De George theory that uh, this, uh, this chi k, the character actually is Hilda continuous. But if you deal with uh, elliptic systems in higher dimensions, the, the, the function, the weak solution may not be uh, Hilda con continuous, may not be even bounded. So one of the uh, techniques to, to deal with that problem, to handle that problem, is to smoothen out uh, this uh, this uh, derivative of u zero uh, uh, in in x k, and I'm also going to put a cutoff function a the epsilon here. It's a uh, it's a cutoff on the boundary, so it's a it's a function between zero and one, and uh, it vanishes uh, in the epsilon actually e three times epsilon neighborhood of of the boundary and uh, away from the boundary by four epsilon, and the, the function is one. So it's a cutoff in, in near the, uh, mostly one in omega, but dies down near the boundary here. Okay, so you'll you see how, how we, why do we need this. Okay, so that is the function uh, uh, w e epsilon here. So that would be the correct, the first of the corrector will subtract. So with this, we have this theorem, uh, again, uh, we do not need any smoothness uh, assumptions on the coefficients. Bounded measurable will work. And A is elliptic, periodic. Omega uh, is uh, bounded and Lipschitz domain. And then this uh, uh, W epsilon. And uh, you take this uh, norm in H1. It's uh, actually in H10 because u epsilon and u0 have the same boundary. I'm dealing with the Dirichlet problem here. And also because of cutoff, the third term here equal to zero on the boundary, actually vanishes near the boundary. So this function w epsilon actually is, is in H10, and uh, it's, it's H10 norm is bounded by constant times the square root of epsilon times uh, uh, the H. H2 norm of u0, okay? So, if, so that's, that's for any epsilon between zero and one here. Uh, the constant only depends on dimension, the ellipticity, and, uh, and the domain omega, <coughs> omega here. And furthermore, if, if the corrector happened to be bounded, like in a scalar case, uh, you actually don't need the cutoff you also don't need a smoothing uh, as epsilon. So you can just take the uh, corrector as, as you have in the two-scale expansion here. <coughs> two-scale expansion here. I want to say, I mean, you may ask, why do you get a, a square root of epsilon instead of epsilon? So if you, you, can, you, can, you can somehow see from, uh, from the left-hand side, and you see that uh, near the boundary, I mean, on the boundary, uh, u epsilon, u zero, uh, they have the same boundary, so the difference is zero on the boundary. But the third term is equal to epsilon uh, times chi of x over epsilon 
times the derivative of U0 on the boundary. And so it's H1 norm somehow equivalent to the H1 half norm on the boundary. If you take a one one, uh, H1 half norm on the boundary of this guy, you're going to generate a, a, a square root of epsilon on the denominator. <coughs> so cancel out this epsilon, you, got, you only come up with a square root of epsilon. So in other words, this estimate is more or less sharp. Okay. So these are the two theorems we will try to prove uh, today here. Okay, so uh, let me explain the smooth. This is a very simple operator, a smoothing operator. Uh, you simply convert, uh, convolute, uh, this is just approximation of identity here. You convolute this, uh, this operator as epsilon, it's just a convolution with, uh, with uh, approximation of identity. Uh, rho is a supporting uh, B0 one half uh, has uh, uh, integral one, and so that, that's a very simple one here, okay? So, so what do you see here, going back to this, is that as far as, I mean, the homogenization deal with large scale properties. So, w w so wh whatever you do below, small, in a small scale, the, the homogenization can, simply cannot see that. And so, so, so whenever you do, you, you, if you d introduce uh, some smoothing at the Eiffel scale, the, the homogenization process simply doesn't care. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that uh, the smoothing operator uh, works really well uh, with, uh, in this situation here. Okay, so, so just remember that uh, the S epsilon, the S epsilon is a simple uh, convolution uh, with the, uh, with All right, so the, the next thing I want to, uh, oh, there, there are some properties which tell you, uh, which we're going to uh, use uh, in the proof of these two theorems. Uh, one of them is that uh, if, you, if you look at this uh, operator, smoothing operator, and then you multiply by a function of g of x over y, and you measure in LP norm. You, you want to estimate in the LP norm here. And of course, if G is bounded, you can simply take this G out, replaced by the L infinity norm of G. But as I said, the character may not be bounded. And so that's the role played by this smoothing operator. So this, tells, this, this estimate tells you that you don't need to worry about. As long as this function G is locally in LP uniformly, you are okay, you have a LP, LP estimate, okay? So again, the reason is that because this is a smoothing or the average at the epsilon scale, anything below epsilon, can, the, the, the operator cannot see that, okay? So you have this estimate here, <coughs> okay? So here is uh, the open set O and uh, in the right hand side you have to expand the, uh, the, the set by, by, uh, by epsilon. So that's the definition here, okay? So the, uh, uh, the proof is, is quite simple. Uh, first of all, by uh, by Hilder's inequality, you can bond the, uh, this uh, a smoothing operator uh, to the piece power by, uh, by this integral of f to the piece power and u epsilon x minus y dy, and using the factor that the integral of uh, rho epsilon is one, is one. Okay, and then you simply use the Fubini theorem. So you multiply gx over epsilon to the both sides and you integrate on the whole space and then you change the order of integration and then you get what you needed. That's all. It's a very simple proof. It's, it's given, it should be given in the lecture notes here. <coughs> okay. All right, the other things I would need is that this approximation. So you have a smoothing, uh, you'll be concerned with uh, uh, the difference of the smoothing with, uh, of f with, uh, f with the function f itself uh, measured in LP norm. Uh, so this is also a very simple uh, lemma. 
and uh, you can uh, prove this uh, again using Okay, so this is by, I think, by Minkowski inequality here. So you, uh, and then you, you write the difference in terms of a gradient, and uh, you re replace, use the Minkowski again, and uh, replace this term in, in this integral, and that's it. Okay? And you, because rho is, suppo is support, supported, uh, uh, in the ball of reals one half, and so you have a y here, and therefore it's after uh, a scale, then you're going to have epsilon come up. Actually, the constant, you can take this to be one. Okay. Again, the proof it's, you can find in the lecture notes uh, in detail. Okay. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is this flux operator. I'll explain why it's called a flux operator. I mean, flux corrector, sorry. I mean, flux corrector. So this is, a, by definition, is a matrix. It's a matrix. B, I, G, A. Uh, B is A, the, uh, the, the, the matrix A of Y, plus A of Y multiplied to the gradient of, uh, of the corrector. So the corrector is a vector value function. You take the gradient, it becomes a matrix. So the second term is a product of two matrices. And the third term is A hat. That is the effective matrix. So we simply call this uh, 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 three terms by, by B here. So if I write out the components, you see that it's a BIGA. Uh, AIGA plus AIK, K summed minus AIGA hat. Okay, so these are the two key properties of uh, of this matrix of this uh, uh, B here. So you'll see how where this coming from. <coughs> so in the first case, so we claim that the the mean. This matrix, by the way, is one periodic because A is one periodic, uh, the character is one periodic, derivative is one periodic, and A hat is a constant. So B, and this is zero. Why this is zero? So if you write, if you just look at this here, you see that this actually is simply equivalent to A I J hat equal to the average of AIJ plus AIK and D, uh, sorry, this is a DYK IJ and uh, integrating in Y. So in other words, that's simply the definition of an effective coefficients. Okay, so the first equation here is simply the definition of AIG hat. That's the first one. The second equation, the second equation, that is if you take the divergence in the, in the first indices, dyi is zero, this is equivalent to, of course you take the derivative of the last term, you got zero, but otherwise you will end up with d dyi, of AIJ plus AIK DIJ DYK equal to zero. And that is just the definition of a corrector. That's how the corrector is defined. So these two equations actually capture what we have done uh, uh, yesterday. I mean, one gave you the definition of the effective coefficient, another gave you uh, the definition of correctors uh, for, for, for chi here. Okay, so this will be a, a play in essential role in, an, in, a, in the following uh, computation here. Okay, so uh, with this property, we can introduce the flux corrector. Uh, that will be called a phi k i j. There are three indices here. Okay, so, uh, so here's a lemma. There is a uh, a function of phi kj in H1, periodic, uh, such that uh, if you take the divergence in the k variable, 
again, the index k is summed, you, you get big. So that's one property. The other property that would be, be also important for us is that uh, among these uh, three indices, it skews symmetric with respect to the first two. So here, if you interchange the index k and the index i, you got a minus sign here. Okay, and this will, will, will be important to us. Okay, and uh, and uh, if you know the character is Hilda continuous. Uh, that is the case of a scalar equation by the George Nash estimate. And then we can prove that uh, this uh, flux character is actually bounded. Uh, but in general, it will just be a, a, a function in H1. All right? Okay, so how do you construct such a function uh, phi uh, here? Okay, we do that by solving a Laplacian equation on the torus. So you have, you, you take a big, and uh, I want to have a function so that Laplacian fig equal to big. So we solve this equation for each fixed ig between one and d. Okay, so here we're looking for a solution fig in H two. This equation is solvable if and only if the right-hand side has mean value zero, and we just happen to have that right here. That, that is the first property. So we need this property to, in order to find the function fig. Otherwise, you don't have a solution. You have to subtract the average, uh, okay? All right, then we define uh, phi ij, phi kij to be the derivative of ij in yk, minus the derivative of fkj in yi. So you see that I interchange the index i and the k, and k and i. So by definition, it has this property automatically. If I interchange k and i, you got a minus sign. Okay, so the question now is how do we know uh, if I take the divergence in k, uh, we got a bij here. Okay, so let's just do some calculation here. All right, so so I have uh, so I have uh, phi k i j is d y k uh, f i j minus uh, d y i f k j. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll take uh, the divergence in k, so phi k i. If I take the divergence here, I take a derivative in y k, so k is summed, the first term is just a Laplacian, and the second term, I'm gonna interchange the order of derivative, take a derivative in k first, f k j, all right? So by definition, this is just equal to b i j but we have this actual term there. And I claim that this, this, this guy actually has to be a constant, and when you take a derivative, you got zero. So subtract zero, and you got b i j. Okay? So how do we know it's zero? Well, we're gonna have to use this equation here. So what you have here, you, you start with Laplacian fij equal to bij, and you take a divergence in, G, in, in i, so that the Laplace of dfij dyi is uh, dbij dyi, you got zero because of this equation. So this function here, I sum in i, that's the same function I have here, except I have a j in this here, is a harmonic function. But it's also a periodic function. The only thing that's harmonic and periodic is a constant, by Louisville theorem. So, uh, 
So, so that the, the last term here drops out, give you zero. When you take a derivative, it got zero, and then you have a big there. So you see this, both of these two properties uh, are needed in order to construct the flux character. Okay. All right, so uh, let me just say a few words. Why do we call this flux character? Uh, so this will actually come up in, in this calculation. We look at this uh, u epsilon u minus u zero plus, let's not worry about the boundaries of the characters, just subtract this term in, the, in this uh, uh, two-scale expansion. And uh, you calculate uh, the flux of u epsilon, which is the gradient multiplied by the matrix, and minus the flux of u zero, Okay, the gradient of u zero multiplied by a hat, and subtract this term b, which I defined earlier here. And in the calculation, you see that you're gonna end up with this term plus a uh, term that is, uh, has a factor epsilon, so this is goes to zero here. So if I take this in L2 norm, that uh, you can measure you can, you can actually uh, uh, just take the L2 norm of these two terms, and uh, you calculate the gradient of uh, W epsilon. And so there, the first three terms are here, and the last term uh, is it's going here, which actually is the same term as I have, pretty much the same as I have here. Uh, all right, so, uh, so you'll see that, you'll see that uh, this flux corrector appear in the derivative for B, and this corrector here appear for the derivative for uh, in, for the for here. So so this uh, this this function phi play the same role as as uh, the corrector chi, except that one is for the gradient, another is for the flux. So it's pretty reasonable to call as a, a flux corrector there. That is, that's, okay. Uh, all right, so this is the, the main lemma we're gonna need to, to prove the, uh, uh, conver the convergence uh, rate in H1, in H1 here. So W epsilon is the same as I defined before. Uh, you have U epsilon minus U zero, and subtract a term. Uh, which is uh, modeled uh, after the third term, uh, so I need to do some smoothing, I also need to do some cutoff near the boundary, and otherwise it's, it's the same here. So uh, omega delta is just a, a layer near the boundary of omega, okay? So, uh, so the estimate is that if I integrate uh, the matrix A of x, uh, x over epsilon times the gradient of W epsilon times a test function, the derivative of a test function per psi, I can estimate this uh, by uh, the H1 